we've survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting the Black Man with a Gun Show podcast. This week, we're going back, back to World War I and us. This is episode number 630, a historical look at World War I, introducing Harlem's Hellfighters and how a shotgun was deemed barbaric by the Germans. All this and a little bit of a special announcement at the end of the show. Coming up next. This portion of the show is brought to you by Black Man with a Gun Reloaded. You can get your autographed copy from me directly by emailing me at blackmanwithagun at gmail.com. For only $20, Black Man with a Gun Reloaded is an autobiographical book about gun control, how it became a trainer, an activist, a speaker for the Second Amendment. This book has a glossary that will make you sharper. It belongs on the bookshelf of every gun owner. Black Man with a Gun Reloaded. Email me at blackmanwithagun at gmail.com today. It's also available on Amazon without the love. Blackmanwithagun.com Ken Blanchard's Pro Gun Podcast. I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Clover Tack and all those who have found me because of my little blurb that's been on his website and on his podcast and then on his YouTube channel. If you've just recently gotten one of the apps, the black man with the gun.org and found me, Hey, thank you so much for being here. Getting like a notification almost every day that somebody new has just got the app. It's free. Thanks to members like you listeners like you that don't think it's robbery to support a brother. They contribute to our Patreon account. And allow me to pay for that developing fee and all that stuff that I pay for monthly to make sure that the app stays current and doesn't get uh, hit by bots and all that other stuff. If you'd like to be a supporter of the show, it would be much appreciated. Links will be in the show notes if you even care. And now, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You know, the longer I stay on this planet, the longer I'm living, sucking in the air, I'm realizing that there's really nothing new under the sun, just like King Solomon said. Sometimes we think that folks have invented things that psh, have been around and come around in cycles, just like gun control. Refusal to stand, for example, during the national anthem became a widespread form of protest during World War I. And in some cases, it was to protest the draft they called conscription back then. Newspapers at the time, which was the media, associated the protests with support for socialism, Bolshevism, and communism. Don't that sound familiar? So let's talk about the flag first, and then World War One. Okay, do you know the um, actual number of stripes we have in the flag? Thirteen. Very good. How about the thirteen colonies? Which states do they represent? I'll give you a chance to figure that out. Give me all thirteen by the end, and uh, see if you got them all right. One of the reasons folks don't have any pride in themselves. If they didn't have to earn anything. When you look at the reasons for doing stuff, it kind of changes your thought pattern. You can't honor something that you don't like, that you don't know about, that you don't trust, that you don't believe in. The colors for the flag were deliberately chosen to represent a theme that the founders felt was important in the building of our nation. The red stands for courage, hardiness, and bloodshed. Courage, because our country is based on the courage of separating from what we once knew, courage of starting over, courage of fighting for our freedom. Hardiness, because the founders of this country believed our country would outlast the land that we came from. And finally, bloodshed to honor all those who lost their life for our freedom and our country. White stands for purity and vigilance. Purity because our country is independent and is not corrupted by any other country. Vigilance because our country needs to be alert and careful 
in the choices that we make. Blue stands for justice and perseverance. Justice because it is the basis for our country. And perseverance because although our nation is young in comparison to so many others, we will stand strong against all opposition. Now, we can fight about all the ills of our society, all our cultures, all the stuff that we've done against each other, black against white, white against brown, white against yellow, white against you name it, white against white. But that's not right now. And I say right now because there will become a time we can have a discussion, we can have a talk. You and me, we can actually talk about race and color and the, the gloves will be off and we can be honest with each other and share how we feel. But not to the point of what media is doing right now, what propaganda is doing right now. Driving wedges, bringing up pain, fears, hatred. Let me explain something to you. I am not um, Uncle Ruckus from Boondocks. I've come a long way in my understanding of human nature, of American history, of humanity itself. And being stung by the same bee over and over again doesn't help anybody. If you want to go there, if you want to talk about it, blackmanwithagun at gmail.com and I'll explain what I'm talking about. Okay? But let's go on. How about those 13 stripes? They stand for the 13 colonies. Did you remember all the states that they connect to? Virginia, New Jersey, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Delaware, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia were the first 13. And you probably know that the Star Spangled Banner became our official uh, national anthem in 1931, originally written September 14th, 1814. In 1892, the flag inspired James B. Upman and Francis Bellamy to write the Pledge of Allegiance. It was first published in a magazine called The Youth's Companion. You see, Francis Bellamy was tasked with developing a patriotic program for schools around the country in commemoration of the 400th year anniversary of Columbus's journey to the New World. The pledge was intended to ensure that younger people knew to respect that flag and to prevent any more civil conflicts in the future. In its original form, the pledge read, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. President Eisenhower added the phrase one nation indivisible under God in 1954 as a response to the fear that atheism was being spread by the Soviet Union. Now for all my humanists and atheists and Satanists and those who agnostics and you name it, let me really mess you up. Remember, I remember I said that everything means something. Check this out. You know how the flag is stored and presented to people and folded at funerals in that triangle? Well, each fold means something. Believe it or not, it's not random, but very purposeful. This is one reason why they will fold an American flag at a veteran's funeral. They always fold the flag, so that way only the blue and white stars can be seen. One reason they do this is so that none of the red shows because it stands for the bloodshed. And we want to remember that person's perseverance and vigilance, not the loss of that person. Even the shape is considered when folding the flag. It is in the shape of a triangle so that it symbolizes the hat worn by revolutionary soldiers. Now I'm really going to get you. Each fold of the American flag, and there are 12 of them before the thing is secured, the first fold is the symbol of life. Fold number two, symbol of belief in eternal life. Fold number three, honor and remembrance of veterans. Fold four, symbol of our weaker nature. Fold number five, tribute to the United States of America. Fold number six, symbol of our hearts and devotion. Fold seven, tribute to the armed forces. Fold eight, for those who went into the valley of the shadow of death. Fold 9, 
is a tribute to womanhood and its giving and nurturing nature. Fold number 10, tribute to our fathers who gave their sons to protect our land. Fold 11, dedication to Jews and represents the bottom of the seal of King David and King Solomon. And fold 12, represents the Christian and glorifies God. See, there was a time when we didn't think it was bad to give honor to God and to country. But let's hit about, uh, let's do World War I now. Are we ready for that? WW1, also known as the First World War or the Great War, was a global war originating in Europe and lasting from 28 July 1914 to 11 November 1918. Get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me. Every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud her boy's in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there, that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum coming everywhere, so prepare, say a prayer, send the word, send the word to beware, we'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't all right, you've probably got the feel for it now. We're in World War I. But now I'm going to go to the place where you probably haven't been before. Harlem. Yeah, Harlem. In the early 1900s. I want to introduce you to the Harlem Hellfighters. They were an African-American infantry unit that spent more time in combat than any other American unit. And despite their courage, sacrifice, and dedication to their country, they were returned home to face racism, bigotry, segregation, and lynching. Let's go back to February 18th, 1919. A day after, 3,000 veterans of the 369th Infantry, formerly the 15th New York Colored Regiment, paraded up from 5th Avenue at 23rd Street to 145th in Lenox, one of the few black combat regiments in World War I. They'd earned the prestigious Croix de Guerre from the French Army, under which they'd served for six months of, quote, brave and bitter fighting, end quote. Their nickname they received from their German foes, Hellfighters, the Harlem Hellfighters. According to the three-page the three page spread from the New York Tribune that ran that day, this is what it said. Up the wide avenue they swung, their smiles outshone the golden sunlight. In every line, proud chests expanded beneath the medals valor had won. The impassioned cheering of the crowds massed along the way drowned the blurring cadence of their former jazz band. The old 15th was on parade, and New York turned out to tender its dark-skinned heroes a New York welcome. That sounds good, doesn't it? In their ranks was one of the great war's greatest heroes, Private Henry Johnson of Albany, New York, who, though riding in a car for the wounded, was so moved by the outpouring he stood and waved the bouquet of flowers he'd been handing. It would take another 77 years for Johnson to receive an official Purple Heart from his own government, but on this day, not even a steel plate in his foot could weigh him down. It was, the newspapers noted, the first opportunity the city of New York had to greet a full regiment of returning doughboys, black or white. The Chicago Defender put the crowd at 2 million, the New York Tribune at 5 million, with even the New York Times conservatively estimating it at hundreds of thousands, never have white Americans, according, 
accorded so heartfelt and hearty a reception to a contingent of their black countrymen. The Tribune continued. And, quote, the ebony warriors felt it, literally beneath a hail of chocolate candy, cigarettes, and coins raining down on them from open windows up and down the avenues. It would have been hard to miss them, at least according to the New York Times, to whom all the men appeared seven feet tall. Yet as rousing as those well-wishers were, the Tribune pointed out the greeting the regiment received along Fifth Avenue was to the tumult which greeted it in Harlem as the west wind to a tornado. After all, 70% of the 369th called Harlem home and their families, friends, and neighbors had turned out in full force to thank and welcome those who'd made it back. 800 hadn't. An absence recalled in a number of handkerchiefs drying wet eyes. That morning, it had taken four trains and two ferries to transport the black veterans and their white officers from Camp Upton on Long Islands to Manhattan and the parade kicking off at 11 a.m. An echo of the armistice that had halted the fighting three months before stretched seven miles long. In his 1845 slave narrative, Frederick Douglass had likened his master to a snake. Now a rattlesnake adorned the black veterans' uniforms, their insignia. On hand to meet, greet them was a host of dignitaries, including an African-American leader, Emmett Scott, special adjutant to the Secretary of War, William Randolph Hearst, and New York's popular Irish Catholic governor, Al Smith, who reviewed his hellfighters from a pair of stands on 60th and 133rd Street. In Harlem, the Chicago Defender observed, February 17, 1919, was an unofficial holiday, with black school children granted dismissal by the Board of Education, a similar greeting on the same day. In fact, met the returning black veterans of the 30, 307th Infantry, to the old English Illinois and Chicago. Chad L. Williams writes in his 2010 book, Torchbearers of Democracy, African American Soldiers in the World War I Era, and in the coming months, there would be other celebrations, even in the Jim Crow South, most notably Savannah, Georgia, the state that in 1917 and 1918 led the nation in lynchings, according to statistics published by the Tuskegee Institute. It was, to be sure, a singular season, a pause between the end of hostilities abroad and the resumption of hostilities at home, in a nation still divided so starkly, so violently by the color line. Congress would not make Armistice Day an official U.S. holiday until 1938, and it would not be called Veterans Day until 1954. But the people of New York didn't need Congress to tell them what to do when their black fighting men returned home. And so you might say the very first Veterans Day parade in New York associated with Armistice Day was held for black soldiers on February 17, 1919, during the month that would eventually be set aside for black history. Two years before, on April 2, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war in order to enter a conflict between European powers that had started over the assassination of an archduke in 1914. The world must be made safe for democracy, the president said. The nation's allies, the British, French, and Russians, its enemies, Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary, and the so-called central powers. For some African-Americans, Wilson's rhetoric smacked of hypocrisy. After all, he was the president who had screened Birth of a Nation, a film glorifying the Ku Klux Klan at the White House and refused to support a federal anti-lynching bill, even though each year averaged more than one lynching a week, predominantly in former Confederate states that had effectively stripped black men of their voting rights. Will someone tell us just how long Mr. Wilson has been a convert to true democracy? The Baltimore Afro-American editorialized on April 28, 1917. Patriotism has no appeal for us, just as has The Messenger, a socialist publication launched by editors Chandler Owen and A. Philip Randolph. Declared on November 1, 1917, a settlement that would land both men in jail under the Espionage Act in 1918. I don't think you realize that in the past, you could not be as vocal in the media without getting locked up for it. 
or worse. Many more blacks viewed the war as an opportunity for victory at home and abroad. W.E.B. Du Bois, founder of the NAACP in 1909, urged his fellow African Americans to, quote, close ranks. In a now infamous piece, he wrote for the crisis in July 1918. Despite the persistent segregation of black officers at training camp, he said, let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder with our white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. Dubois advised a stance, Williams notes, that would stir a controversy when Dubois was exposed for making simultaneous efforts to secure a captaincy for himself. Nobody gets through here without doing some stuff, man. There's always some stuff in the background. In all, 2.3 million blacks registered for the draft during World War I, although the Marines would not accept them, and the Navy enlisted a few and only in menial positions, large numbers served in the Army. Some 375 blacks served overall, including 639 men who received commissions, a historical first. And this is all from an essay written, mission before, African Americans and World War I. The U.S. Army segregated its black troops into two combat divisions, the 92nd and the 93rd, because War planners deemed racial segregation, just as in civilian life, the most logical and efficient way of managing the presence of African Americans in the Army. This is a quote from a researcher. But a different kind of violence soon spread at home, most notably in East St. Louis, where on July 2, 1917, the rumor that a black man had killed a white man resulted in the murder of nine whites and hundreds of blacks, not to mention half a million dollars of property damage. Things weren't much better in the South. On August 23, 1917, black soldiers in the 24th Infantry garrisoned in Houston revolted when one of their comrades was beaten and arrested by two white police officers after he tried to stop them from arresting a black woman. Quickly, rumors flew that a white mob was approaching the camp, which, whether true or not, prompted the black troops to scour the camp for ammunition under the notion that the best defense is a good offense. Marching through the rain to Houston, they killed 15 people, including four policemen and a member of the Illinois National Guard. Two of the black soldiers died in the fighting, one shooting himself in the head rather than risking capture. Ten men probably could not begin to tell the complete story of what took place that night. A guy by the name of Lentz Smith quotes, Army Prosecutor um, Colonel Hull, yet in the fallout, they charged 63 members of the battalion with mutiny and hanged 13 in their army khakis. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there, that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum coming everywhere, so prepare. Of the 375,000 blacks who served in World War I, 200,000 shipped out overseas, but even in the theater of war, few saw combat. Most suffered through back-breaking labor in non-combat service units as part of the services of supply. Lentz Smith puts the number of combat troops at 40,000, 42,000, only 11% of all blacks in the Army. For the first of the two black combat divisions, the 92nd, the Great War, was a nightmare. Not only were they segregated, their leaders scapegoated them for the American Expeditionary Forces failure at Meuse Argonne in 1918. Even though troops were from both races, struggled during the campaign, in the aftermath, five black officers were court-martialed on trumped-up charges with white Major J.N. Merrill of the 368th's 1st Battalion writing his superior officer that, without my presence or that of any other white officer, right on the fire line, I am absolutely positive that not a single colored officer would have advanced with his men. The cowardice showed by the men was abject. Now, even though Secretary of War Newton Baker eventually commuted the officer's sentences, the damage was done. The 92nd was off the line. In contrast, General John J. Pershing, the commander of expeditionary forces in Europe, assigned the 93rd Combat Division to the French Army. The 93rd consisted of the 369th, the 37th, the 371st, the 372nd Infantry Regiment, Get my numbers mixed up now. 
and with the French, the Harlem Hellfighters fought at Chateau Terry and Bellow Wood, a resource for teachers, states on the National Archives website, quote, all told they spent 191 days in combat, longer than any other American unit in the war. They gave no ground to the enemy, and none of their men were captured, although, as we shall see, at least one came close. All right, so what does that have to do with gun rights, gun ownership today? Well, legacy and history are very important to us. My uncle-in-law, uncle from my wife's side, served in World War I, and he was quite proud of what he did in France. I mean, I thought he was going to turn a different shade of brown. He was so puffed up and happy. He did something over there. Yeah, he even had a little little French uh, dialogue he would go into when he started talking and telling the story. But these veterans came home full of pride for their country and got abused, still trained in firearms. It caused some trouble back home. This went through generations and led to where we are now. How they were treated with being people of arms, being veterans, all of that's connected. And none of it is new. Being an armed citizen means having a gun with you all the time. Carrying a firearm every day requires a holster that is both concealable and comfortable. Whether you choose our Super Tuck Deluxe or Mini Tuck, you'll have the confidence that comes from being discreetly and comfortably armed, prepared to face unforeseen dangers. Crossbreed holsters are handmade in the USA, come with a lifetime warranty and a two-week try-it-free guarantee. Order your holster today at CrossbreedHolsters.com. And since we're still talking about World War I, do you believe that once upon a time Germany declared that shotguns were inhumane? This is from an article written by David Hunt. World War I talked about the Model 97 trench gun. Having been the first to unleash unrestricted submarine warfare, poisonous gas, and the flight for warfin, one man flamethrower, On his enemies, the Germans finally found a weapon too horrific for use during the Great War, and it was a shotgun that American troops brought to the front in 1918. In 1900, during the Philippine insurrection, Captain John Pershing saw combat against the German Tados, a fanatical Islamic moral swordsman who sought martyrdom while killing their enemies. The Army Colt 38 didn't stop their suicidal attacks, and even the Springfield rifle didn't always do the job. In such close-quarter fighting, the Model 97 riot gun, a pump-action shotgun, usually gave the Germantados the desired martyrdom. As commander of the American Expeditionary Force in France, then-General John Black Jack Pershing saw the need for the close-range firepower when fighting in the trenches and remembered the Germantados. He had the Ordnance Department work with the Winchester Repeating Arms Company to modify their Winchester Model 1897 shotgun. What evolved was the Model 97 trench gun, a a pump-action 12-gauge shotgun with a 20-inch barrel, a sling swivel, and a bayonet adapter with a perforated metal heat shield over the barrel, and without the heat shield, the barrel could get too hot to hold when using the bayonet, with one in the spout chambered and five in this tubular magazine the trench gun could hold six shotgun shells. 
normal cartridges made of a brass base with a cardboard tube were unfit for the terrible conditions at the front. The cardboard would get wet, swelled up, and jammed, so all brass cartridges were used. Each two and three quarter inch shells contained nine double odd buckshot pellets, each with a diameter of about 0.33 of an inch. This Winchester shotgun also had a slam fire mode. With an ordinary pump action shotgun, the shooter ejects any spent cartridge and chambers a shell by pulling back on the pump, the sliding forearm handle, and pushing the pump forward. Then the shotgun can be fired by pulling the trigger, by squeezing and holding the trigger while pumping. The trench gun would fire every time the pump was pushed forward. A trained soldier could fire six shotgun blasts with devastating effect against unarmored targets in less than two seconds. A canvas pouch held an additional 32 shells, but if he couldn't reload, he still had his bayonet. By June 1918, there were only enough to supply each division with 50 trench guns, but they were put to devastating use. When these soldiers, equipped with Model 97 trench guns, jumped into an enemy trench, they were able to clear it quickly in both directions using the slam fire mode. The relatively short barrel length allowed them to quickly swing in either direction in the marrow, confines of the trench. In a matter of seconds, 54 8.4 millimeter balls of buckshot, or .33 inches, with an effective range of up to 50 yards tore up anyone in their way. Such firepower restricted in the close in fighting, had a greater hit probability than any available automatic weapons of the time. They became known as trench brooms or trench sweepers. And the enemy didn't like these trench brooms one bit. In September 1918, the German government issued a diplomatic protest, complaining that the Model 97 trench gun was illegal because it, quote, isn't especially forbidden to employ arms, projections, or materials calculated to cause unnecessary suffering, as defined in the 1907 Hague Convention respecting the laws and customs of war on land. When the Americans rejected this, the German high command then threatened to execute any soldier caught with a trench gun, or even just trench gun shells, and General Black Jack Persing replied that, henceforth, any Germans caught with flamethrowers or sawed blade bayonets would be lined up and shot. As far as is known, no American or German POWs were executed under such circumstances, of course. In the news this week, I was notified that the inaugural convention for the National African American Gun Association has been officially selected and will take place August 14th, 15th, and 16th in 2020. The location will be at the beautiful Epicenter, located in the Atlanta metro area, and this will be the first time in history of the United States that an African American firearms organization has had an inaugural event of any kind. So in short, the National African American Gun Association will have its first convention in 2020. And now another announcement that um, if you listen to the whole episode, you got a chance to hear this part from me. So I guarantee you there'll be 3,000 other people who didn't hear this part and they'll be like, hey, what happened to the shows? It has been suggested to me to take a break. And this podcast will be on hiatus. Well, give me an opportunity to... Uh, Catch my breath, reassess, and tweak some stuff. Yeah, I'm going on break after this episode. I know some of you just discovered me, but there are like 600 plus episodes in the back catalog for you to check out while I'm on my rest. I'll be back in about 10 weeks. I want to record an audio book, uh, the audio version of my book. Yeah, that's more like it. Do some YouTube stuff. Shoot a whole lot. Rest. Think. Create, rinse, and repeat. So, I'm going to take a break for 10 weeks of the Black Man with the Gun show. And I ask that you just keep on rolling. If you're new to the show, go back and listen to the other 629 other episodes that you haven't heard yet. I'm going to sign, try to stay in touch with those who have the app at blackmanwithagun.org and um, probably appear and be heard on radio and other people's podcasts while I'm resting, no doubt. And there'll be a whole bunch of folks who pop up in those 10 weeks, I'm sure. There are lots of 
pro-gun folks trying to make a difference right now. And that's a good thing. Yep, I think that's it for the news. Nag is having this convention, and I'll be taking a break. I'm really hoping that you like this episode, that um, you learn some stuff that you probably have never heard before, that you have got questions for it. You can always check it out. Write the stuff down. Do some searching on your own. Check the facts. See whether I'm making this stuff up or not. And um, if you find something different, feel free to give me a buzz. We can talk about it. We can. You can correct me. I have no problem with that at all. If you find something different and have sources and all that too, don't mind at all. If you're going to the Gun Rights Policy Conference, you get a chance to see me there. And I'll be chilling like a villain, most definitely. Always remember you are braver than you believe. You're stronger than you seem. And you're smarter than you think. And believe it or not, you're loved more than you know. Just in case nobody else has told you this today. I love you. There's not a damn thing you can do about it. Until the next time. Shalom, baby. Sheriff, you can't go now. We need you. The work here is done. I'm needed elsewhere now. I'm needed wherever outlaws rule the West, wherever innocent women and children are afraid to walk the streets, wherever a man cannot live in simple dignity, and wherever a people cry out for justice. Oh, All right, you caught me. Where are you headed, cowboy? Nowhere special. Nowhere special. I always wanted to go there. Come on. touch with Ken and his cause, head over to blackmanwithagun.com.